All right, I'm going to read um, chapter 16 from Freak the Mighty on page 100, and it is called A Chip Off the Old Block. So once on the TV, this dude hypnotized a lobster. Maybe you saw it. He touches a lobster and it freezes. It just can't move. That's sort of what happens to me when his hand clamps over my mouth. Like I'm paralyzed and my head is empty and all there is in the world is that big hand and his cool breath like the wind. So, this is where the geezers stuck you, huh? He whispers. Down in the basement, out of sight, out of mind. I still can't see his face. He's this huge shape in the room. Everything changes now, he says. It's time I got to know my own son, who had his mind poisoned against me. He makes me sit up and shushes me to make sure I won't make any noise. Making noise is the last thing I want to do, because I don't know whether or not Grimm ever bought that gun he mentioned, or what might happen to him if he tries to use it. Graham's bad dream about Grimm getting shot with his own gun seems pretty real right now, and I don't want to be the one to make it come true. I know what they told you, he says. It's all a big lie, you understand? I never killed anybody, and that's the truth, so help me God. By now, I am sitting up on the bed, and he's making me put on my clothes, and the weird thing is, none of this is a surprise. Somehow, I always knew this was going to happen, and he would come for me in the night, and that I would wake up to find him there, filling the room, and that I'd feel empty. I'm so weak, I can hardly put my shoes on. Like when you wake up and your arm is still asleep and you can't hardly move it, that's what I feel like all over, numb and prickly and as light as a balloon like my hands might float up in the air if I let them. This will be an adventure, he says. You're going to have the time of your life, boy. Okay, we're leaving, and not a peep out of you. This will be an... <clears throat> the bulkhead door is open, and you can see the stars. Some people think the stars look close enough to touch, but Freak says the sky is like a photograph from a billion years ago. It's just some old movie they're showing up there, and lots of those stars have switched off by now. They're already dead, and what we're seeing is the rerun, which makes sense if you think about it. Someday, the rerun will come to an end, and you'll see all the stars start to flick off, like a billion little flames blown out by the wind. This way, he says, quiet as a mouse. There's no snow on the ground. Oh, there's snow on the ground. Not a lot enough to cover the ground. I can tell how cold the air is, but I can't feel it, even without a jacket, which I didn't have time to put on. The cold doesn't matter. Nothing does, really. Not Grim and Graham or the old stars in the sky or Freak or the fair Gwen. They're all just make-believe. This dream I was having for a long time, and now I am awake again, and he's still filling the room somehow, even though we're outside. The lights are out at Freak's house, and I'm thinking, the stars flicked off, and I don't even know why I'm thinking that. It's like a dead voice in my head or something. We're under a street light when he says, let me look at you. He's got these big eyebrows, and it makes it hard to see his eyes. And that's fine. I don't want to see them. Looking at those eyes is asking to have a bad dream. My, my, he says, checking me out. Will you look at this? It's like I'm looking at an old picture of myself. You really are, are, are a chip off the old block. You know that? I don't say anything. And he reaches out and he touches my face real gentle. As if he'd never heard a fly. I say... Boy, do you know that? Answer me now. Yes, sir, I say. Everybody says so. Christmas Eve, 
he says. You know how many Christmas Eves I've been deprived of my own blood, Ken? Now, is that fair to do that to a man? Lock him up for a crime he never did? He's waiting for me to answer. And I say, no, sir, not fair. That's over and done now, he says. We're starting fresh. Just you and me, boy. That's how it was meant to be. I'm standing there under the street light, and it's amazing how quiet it is like everybody went away or died. The quiet is almost as big as he is. He's as tall as me, only wider everywhere. And for some reason, maybe because we're not far from Freak's house, I'm thinking this weird thought. He doesn't need a suit of armor. No, and he doesn't need a horse or a lance or a pledge to the king or the love of a fair lady. He doesn't need anything except what he is. He's everything all rolled into one, and no one can ever beat him, not even the brave Lancelot. He's squinting around, his eyebrows are furrowed shadows, and he says, You know what I think of when I see this neighborhood like this? Hamsters, is what I think. That's how these people live, like hamsters in a cage. They have their little wheels to run on, and that's what, what they do for the whole of their lives. They run and get nowhere. They just spin. I stand there. They poisoned you against me. I know that, he says. Give it time. You'll see the truth. He starts walking fast, and I walk with him. My feet are already nowhere to go. We're going down to the pond, all cold and white and frozen. Tomorrow morning, a bunch of kids will take their new sleds and skate out there and probably lose their new mittens and scarfs and get yelled at by their moms and dads but tonight the pond is as empty as the moon as empty as my head once a car goes by real slow around the pond and I've got this strange feeling there's no one at the wheel he hooks his finger in my shirt collar and he makes me duck down until the car goes by the car passes and you can't see through the dark windows and you can't hear the snow crunching under the tires squeaking and frozen. We're invisible, he says, making me stand up. Now, now, isn't that a kick in the pants? My feet already know where we're going. The New Testaments. There are a few lights on in the old buildings, and you can see some of the windows are cracked. It looks like a knife cut against the light, and he's saying, you know about Mary and Joseph and how they sought shelter in Bethlehem? And how the baby Jesus was born in a manger? I try to nod. And the funny thing is, is even though I'm not cold, my teeth are chattering. So it's like the rest of me is freezing, but my head hasn't noticed. That's what we're doing. We're seeking shelter, he says. Except this isn't exactly a manger we're going to. No, sir, I say. It sure isn't. He touches me real soft on the back of the neck and says... I didn't ask you a question, boy. Rule number one, don't sass your old man. I make sure my mouth stays shut. We're coming up on the testaments, and they look almost pretty with the new snow coating the roofs and making the yards clean and white and soft. You can see where the old bike handlebars coming up through the snow and the shapes of the other things left out, and even the old car up on the block looks new, like it might take off into the air without any wheels. I know where we're going, even though he doesn't tell me. The door opens before we get there, and Loretta Lee is standing in the light, and she's saying, Iggy, come look what the cat dragged in. He says, say, say hello to my boy, Loretta. Ain't he a chip off the old block? Then we're inside, and Iggy is there, bolting the door behind us and closing the shades and Loretta she's wearing this real slinky red dress that looks like it might fall off if she sneezed and she says mission accomplished hey Kenny I knew you could do it if anybody could Iggy says watch your mouth Loretta I do, do believe you've been drinking my father says has she been drinking Iggy I thought I made myself clear. Hey, it's Christmas Eve, 
Iggy says, and he sounded real nervous. A little punch? What can it hurt? A little punch? Loretta asks, and her voice is slurpy. That's all. And she's wearing these fake eyelashes, and they're coming loose, so her eyes look almost as blurry as her red mouth. I know, because she keeps flapping her eyes at me and smiling, so I can see where the lipstick got on her teeth. Iggy says, She's okay, Kenny. You got my word. Oh, right, Loretta says. Turned over a new leaf, Preacher Kane. Turned over a new leaf, so there's no booze for anybody on Christmas Eve, even in our own house where a man is his castle. Oh, shut it, Iggy says. And he makes Loretta sit down on the busted couch where she kind of leans over and waves at me. Wink, wink. Bring me and my boy some food, my father says. We've been out in the cold for eight long years, and we're hungry, aren't we, son? Yes, sir, I say. Iggy goes out into the kitchen to fry up some hamburgers, and we sit there waiting, not saying anything. Loretta is snuggled up on the couch, passed out with her dreamy look on her face. I eat the greasy hamburger, even though I can hardly stand to swallow. And Iggy is fussing around like it's such a big deal having Kenny Kane in the house. And it's hard to believe he's the same Iggy who is the boss of the Panheads, this motorcycle gang that strikes fear into the hearts of everybody, including the cops. Then Loretta wakes up and stretches like a cat, yawning so that you can practically see right down her throat. And she says, I guess I needed that. And then she giggles, hiding her mouth. I guess I need a lot of things. My father wipes his mouth with his folded up napkin and he ignores her and looks at Iggy and says, you ever do time? You could be a cook. Iggy gives him this nervous, <laughs> like wouldn't that be fun being a cook in prison? He says, anytime you want, I'll show you that place I told you about. My father stands up. Now is good, he says and he looks right at me. Come on, boy. And that's the end of chapter number 16, which was again called A Chip Off the Old Block. <laughs>